reporting online showing apparent shelling of popular spots in Kharkiv. Reports that bullets hit shopping centers, shattering glass and causing fiery explosions. To the west, large blasts shake Ukraine's capital city as Russian troops and tanks close in. But as Russia's military forces its way in, many Ukrainians refuse to back down. We're just calling all mothers of the Russian Federation to st stop their sons not to go to Ukraine. The talks between Russia and Ukraine meeting for the first time since the start of the invasion. A humanitarian crisis unfolding in Ukraine. More than 520,000 refugees fled in just five days, pushing through the borders of neighboring countries, desperately seeking safety, many of them escaping their homes with only what they could carry. There is no scheduled train. They're possible maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow morning, maybe in two days. The heart-wrenching goodbye for families torn apart, unsure of when they will reunite. A papa stavili v Kyiv. Boxer Brothers putting up a different kind of fight. The mayor of Ukraine's capital and his sibling helped to organize defense against Russia's attack as they push harder and harder against Kyiv. Don't let it happen, continue happening in Ukraine. Don't let it happen in Europe and eventually in the world. Russian President Vladimir Putin parades propaganda to his people, calling it a, quote, empire of lies. Protests fill the streets of Moscow for another day. ABC News Live continues to bring you the latest from Ukraine to Russia to Poland to the White House. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight once again with Russia's all-out war in Ukraine, now five days in, and Ukrainian fighters bravely holding off Russian forces for longer than many anticipated. No major cities are currently under Russian control tonight. More explosions, though, today, as the immense human cost of this war is now on full display. Hundreds of Ukrainians have already been killed, including children. And the heart-wrenching images that we've been showing you for the past few days, the hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians on the move. Families forced to separate men 18 to 60 years old staying behind to fight. These new satellite photos show a convoy of Russian military vehicles some 17 miles long heading toward Kyiv, an indication of what those Ukrainian forces will soon be up against. In Belarus today, both sides meeting for six hours, agreeing only that they will meet again. In Russia, the cost of this war is rising as well. Long lines for cash and ATMs there, the ruble sinking in value. And the terrifying prospect looming all over this, Vladimir Putin putting his country's nuclear forces on high alert. President Biden, though, today saying Americans should not worry about nuclear war. On the ground in Ukraine tonight, reports of cluster bombs and war crime accusations being leveled against Russia. We once again have team coverage tonight and are standing by to hear from a member of parliament in Ukraine. But first, our Ian panel reports in once again from Kyiv. Tonight, Russian shells pummeling a residential neighborhood in Kharkiv, the second largest city in Ukraine. Officials there saying dozens of civilians were killed in potentially the worst single attack of this war. Human Rights Watch accusing the Russians of using cluster bombs on the city. If verified, a deliberate attack on civilian areas would be a war crime. Ceasefire talks between Ukraine and Russia on the border with Belarus ended after six hours with no deal, but an agreement to try to meet again in the coming days. With the Russian advance slowed by a fierce Ukrainian defense, there are fears Putin will intensify his attacks, already raising tensions with the West even higher by putting Russia's nuclear forces on heightened alert. President Biden answered with one word when asked today if Americans should be worried about nuclear war. Mr. President, should Americans be worried about nuclear war? No. The Pentagon says Russia still has significant combat power, but has met stiff resistance from the Ukrainians. It's clear the Russians have not made the progress that they wanted to make by day five. New satellite images today show a miles-long column of Russian armed vehicles and tanks just 70 miles from the center of Kyiv. But Putin's army being met head on. The Ukrainians releasing this drone video from outside of the capital claiming to have knocked out part of the Russian column. Burned out vehicles littering the roads around Kyiv. And north of the city, these locals reportedly stopping a Russian tank from entering their village. In Kharkiv this weekend, Ukrainian forces battled Russian troops in the streets, even forcing them to retreat in a relentless defense of the city. 
But in the south, Russians appear to be advancing on the strategic Black Sea port of Mariupol. Heartbreaking images emerging there of some of the youngest casualties of this war. Here, a nine-year-old girl lies in the back of an ambulance as a medic races to save her life. It was too late. At least 16 children have already been killed in the fighting, which officials say has claimed over 350 lives in all. After rallying his fighters over the weekend, Ukrainian President Zelensky today praising the heroic defense being put up by his army and the country's citizen soldiers, saying Ukrainians have shown who we are. Russia has shown what it's become. He later signed an application to join the European Union. It's a symbolic move that could take years to pass. Even so, it's a message of defiance to Putin. And around the world, outrage at this brutal invasion is only growing. The UN General Assembly held its first emergency session in decades. Officials warning they're preparing for up to 4 million refugees from Ukraine in coming days and weeks. Well, we're here in one of the main train stations in Kiev, and you can see the crush and the desperation of people desperate to get out of a city, fearing that it could come under siege from the Russians at any time. French President Macron calling Putin today, who reportedly agreed to hold all strikes on civilians. But there's no evidence that's happening from a man who also said he wasn't going to invade in the first place. In Belarus, to Ukraine's north, American diplomats could be seen taking down the flag at the embassy in Minsk today, which is now suspending operations. And in the capital, tensions rising with every passing hour. Volodymyr Tkachuk, a former soldier, picking up his ammunition in defense of his country. Do you have javelins here? Oh, okay, <laughs> secrets. But, but, it's, but they're very... They're, for you, tactically, javelins are helpful. Ian Panel joins us tonight once again from Kyiv. Ian Zelensky has urged the U.S. and NATO to impose a no-fly zone over significant parts of the country. Explain why that's not likely to happen. Yeah, that's right, Lindsay. It's actually something that I keep hearing repeatedly on the ground. It's something that I've heard in other conflicts because, of course, that would try and balance the equation between the two military forces because it would limit Russia's ability to conduct aerial operations. But the White House is ruling it out, and here's why. Because they've said that they would not want to deploy U.S military. Uh, and if you're having a no-fly zone, then, of course, U.S. military would have to be deployed to the area, and you would need support staff, and that would mean them potentially flying over Ukraine. And here is the second, even biggest risk. It would run a significant risk of a potential direct conflict with Russian forces. Again, that's something that President Biden, the White House, the administration has been very clear is not going to happen. Lindsay? Right. Makes sense. All right. Ian Panel, thanks so much as always. Fear, dread, despair, those are just some of the flurry of feelings being felt by hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians trying to make a mad dash out of their homeland. Women not knowing if they'll ever see their husbands again as children shed tears. While they may be young, they're certainly old enough to understand why their fathers are staying behind to fight. Our Matt Gutman has the latest on the Ukrainian refugee crisis. In Ukraine tonight, this little girl on the train, sobbing into her stuffed animal, just one of the more than 500,000 people leaving everything behind, fleeing in crammed trains, and cars and buses log jammed for dozens of miles, tens of thousands on foot, dragging bags, clutching their children. The hub of the biggest, fastest displacement of people since World War II was Lviv. We were at the station this morning as that train to Poland clanked in. Thousands packed into the tunnels, standing on the stairs, documents in hand, bags at the ready for their chance. <laughs> Authorities handing out food, which was passed back hand to hand down the stairs. With men of fighting age banned from leaving, it was the very young and very old. The majority, women and children. Yesterday, there weren't enough trains. This is absolute no, chaos. There is no scheduled train. The possible, maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow morning, maybe in two days. Today, the trains did arrive, but very few men from any country allowed on. We've been watching this group of South Asians and Africans try to get on this train. They keep getting pushed back. They're told only women and children told to wait their turn, but they've been here for days. Their turn hasn't come. The routes out of this country littered with sorrow and fear. 
this boy on the road to the border. He takes a breath because what he's about to say was so hard. Papa будет продавать что-то, будет помогать нашим героям, нашим войскам, нашим войскам будет помогать, может даже будет воевать. Back on that train platform, the doors close. That little girl still crying. Her mother crying too. I was told they're leaving the girl's father behind. That hand on the window, those tears, the language of exile. Those tears certainly need no translation. Matt Gutman joins us now from Lviv in western Ukraine. Matt, you've been on both sides of the border in recent days. Where are most of the people going once they reach Poland? You know, Lindsay, there's a pretty sizable Ukrainian community in Poland, somewhere between one and two million people. They've been there for years. Uh, many of them are established in Poland, and so that's where many of the refugees are going, to family members, acquaintances, friends. But Poles are opening up their homes as well. In fact, one of our producers who lives in Warsaw has opened up one of his flats or an apartment of his. He's uh, in the south of the country. He gave up his flat for a family coming in from Ukraine. So there is a real outpouring of generosity among uh, the Polish people. Obviously, um, there are also people from Ukraine who are making that exodus or going to other countries in Europe, but a lot of them are staying in Poland, Lindsay. All right, Matt Gutman, our thanks to you once again. Fighting has not slowed, and hundreds of thousands are now seeking shelter, including member of the Ukrainian parliament, Solomia Bavrovska, who joins us now from a bunker in Ukraine. Uh, thank you so much, first of all, for, for talking with us tonight. This is, of course, very personal to you. This is your home. Just give us a sense of what you're feeling right now. Uh, sometimes I feel that that's total unreal new world, and I can imagine that this, the fifth day, it's ongoing war in, in Ukraine. I do remember when I read the last Twitter of one of the American senators saying that Russia is starting the war invasion in, into Ukraine. In 15 minutes, I got the link with the Putin's speech, and in 30 minutes, I heard the shelling in Kyiv. Um, so I still don't believe, I, I can't believe that I see thousands of people moving to the West, trying to uh, to leave the state. And I can't believe how how different nations, all my, my, all my nation is uh, behaving, uh, fighting for, uh, for being independent and saying no to Russia. What can you tell us about the fight that's going on right now in Ukraine? So we heard um, approximately an hour ago the shelling near Kyiv on uh, the main roads, uh, which are leading from, from Kyiv to, to the west or to the south. Uh, we, have now sh we had shelling in today in Kharkiv, that's in the, in the east, and uh, three children uh, died after the mm. great bombing, uh, that's the heavy artillery. Uh, and they started to bomb the civilians, uh, civilian houses, buildings, uh, in, and that's, that's incredible. What 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 we see now? For now, more, more than more than 350 people, civilian, died because of the heavy shelling and bombing. Have you seen the damage firsthand yourself? Are you are you leaving and going out and, and walking the streets at all, or it's just far too dangerous? Uh, no, we have uh, in Kiev. We had from the Saturday night until the today's morning. Um, the time we cannot move. We are not allowed to move. Only for for people who have the special permission uh, permissions. Uh, in some cities, it's uh, on the nights are forbidden to go somewhere. We uh, we uh, every hour, every second hour, in a lot of or majority cities, we hear we hear the sirens. That it means we have to go to a shelter, to the nearest shelter, and to wait up till the the the, the um, government will allow us to go out. Is there enough food and water and and other supplies, medicine for for people who are in shelter right now? Uh, no, that's that was the problem, especially in, in Kiev. Uh, we had uh, women who 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 were giving the birth to um, their children. Uh, we had, unfortunately, we have the humanitarian catastrophe now in the very east. We can help them with any aid, including food, medicine, and even water. Uh, and that's, that's now we have the negotiations with the Red Cross uh, in order them to, um, to be allowed 
to bring food and necessary stuff. Uh, what kind of support have you felt from the U.S. and other NATO allies? The military supplies are uh, the most important. And of course, we're waiting for the, the, the main um, thing we were stressing on this to establish non-flying zone over Ukraine. That will help us and prevent from the bombing from the above, from the sky. And uh, uh, we, we suppose we can, we can prevent uh, refugee, uh, refugees from, the, from the moving out from Ukraine. Uh, and that's the, the main thing. Tell us about the Ukrainian spirit, and of course we've been hearing about the men and, and women as well who are not trained in the military but are taking up arms and fighting for their country. How long do you think that they're going to be able to hold Russia off from taking control of Kyiv? You have to understand that the, the first line of defending is the Ukrainian armed forces, and we truly believe in now staying all nation from the little small children up till the, the man with 70 plus years who we just this uh, this day just went out uh, against the tanks and saying no, we are not allowed to come to my village because it's a Ukrainian village. Go home. That's that's the mood of Ukrainians. We are staying behind all together, and we do understand that with the total second line staying behind the, their shoulders. Uh, and I think we will fight till the end. We will fight until the end. Solomia Bavravska, we thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Stay safe. Our our hearts go out thank to you. to you. Russia is quickly feeling the impact of sanctions hitting the country, with the U.S. now freezing assets of Russia's central bank, and the Russian ruble is crashing in value. As Russians feel the economic pinch, is Vladimir Putin feeling any pressure? ABC's James Longman reports in once again tonight from Moscow. <laughs> Moscow feels increasingly like the capital of a police state. As Putin isolates Russia from the world, riot police flooding the center of town are keeping his people at arm's length too. The Kremlin is the most imposing seat of Russian power. The bridge opposite, also the place where almost seven years ago to the day, Putin's fierce critic, Russian opposition leader Boris Nemtsov, was shot to death. Now, once again, unrest is in the air. Authorities are worried this unpopular war will mobilize dissent. But already, it has. More than 5,500 people have been detained by riot police. Their crime? Peacefully protesting. They're anti-war especially against a close neighbor with whom they have so much in common. I don't want this war. Almost no one here wants it. I want the whole world to see that we don't want it. We don't want it to weigh on our conscience for decades. I don't want to feel guilty for living here through my whole life. Putin has carefully cultivated an image as a calculating statesman over the last 20 years using scare tactics on the West. But in the last week, it's his own people who have perhaps been just as intimidated. The fear was plain to see on the face of his foreign spy chief, who he humiliated during a televised national security meeting last week. As the chief stammered when questioned, Putin told him to speak clearly and directly. The official later taking to Russian state television, supporting the aggressive campaign against Ukraine. And there was another even bigger fright days later, when Putin played the nuclear card. He claimed to have put his nuclear deterrent into a state of heightened alert. Belarus, a close Russian ally, approving a new constitution, ditching its non-nuclear status, which would open the door for Russia to position nukes even closer to European Union states. But all this has consequences. The world is quickly imposing damning and crippling economic sanctions against Russia, and the sting is already being felt. A lot of countries have already closed their airspace to Russian airlines, and FIFA, football's world governing body, is going to suspend Russia until further notice, meaning their stake in this year's World Cup is in jeopardy. The Russian central bank also shut down stock trading Monday, the ruble already losing more than 30% of its value against the dollar. Fearing they'll be choked off from the global market soon, ordinary Russians have been lining up at banks to withdraw cash. Already $10 billion have been taken out in just one week. These consequences are very unpleasant. I'm used to living in the 21st century where I can just use my credit card. I haven't used cash in five years. This will really impact me strongly. Since the fall of the Soviet Union, middle-class Russians have enjoyed closer economic and cultural ties with Europe, and the thought of going back is a hard pill to swallow for a lot of people here. Of course I want to travel. I want to witness global achievements to benefit from them. 
This is all I want, to travel freely and see how the world develops and be a part of it. Ordinary Russians are already starting to see their lives change because of sanctions. But Vladimir Putin might be able to convince them that it's the West's fault. But what about those closest to him, the elites, the ones who've benefited from the luxurious perks of modern Russian life? Do they really want to follow Vladimir Putin down this apparent path towards Russian isolationism and economic misery? This war suggests Vladimir Putin is ready to eliminate the progress of the last 30 years. Both the super-rich and ordinary Russians will feel the changes in their own ways. The question is whether anyone can prevent the Iron Curtain from going back up. Lindsay, the impact of these sanctions is really being felt now. We've seen lines of people trying to get their cash out. But the stock market now, after having been closed today, looks like it's going to be closed for the next few days. There is real concern here about the ruble dropping significantly against the dollar. There is going to be a really difficult period of economic hardship for the people of Russia. And it's going to be up to Vladimir Putin and his inner circle to sell this war to the Russian people. Lindsay. James, thank you. Joining us now is the former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Russia under Boris Yeltsin in the 90s, Andrei Kozarev. Well, we've seen the sanctions ramp up against Russia's top officials, including Putin and Lavrov. Uh, once served as your deputy, uh, you know him very well. Attempt to take us inside his mind tonight. Is there any chance that these sanctions get Lavrov and, and Putin back to the table diplomatically? Uh, I used to know him very well. He was my friend, uh, but uh, today uh, I haven't seen him for a couple of years at all. Uh, and it, he looks and behaves like a different person. Uh, definitely on opposite side of political spectrum than he was with me because uh, we worked for a partnership with the West. and. Uh, with Ukraine and other countries around Russia. But now it's totally uh, opposite. So uh, what happens in their minds? Uh, probably uh, their assets, both of them, uh, and especially Mr. Putin, are under different names. It takes special effort. It, it is not on the name of Mr. Putin, definitely. At this point, do you believe that those around Putin are only telling him just whatever he wants to hear? And do you think that that could have perhaps led to, to Putin miscalculating the kind of resistance that he would face from Ukrainians trying to defend their country? Definitely. For last years, they seem to be listening to their own propaganda. Uh, you know, it's unbelievable. And that uh, led to two major mistakes. One is that they thought that the West are cowards mm. and they would not be able to move, including the United States. And the same they thought about the Ukrainian people. Both of these are now, uh, unfortunately, a little late, uh, but still, now it's all failed and that's why uh, Putin is uh, furious on one side and uh, desperate on the other. And that's why he bluffs with the nuclear threat. You think it's just a bluff? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when he threatens a nuclear war against the United States, that means that uh, there will be retaliatory strike and uh, the balance of power is characterized by what is known as MAD. It's mutual assured destruction. But you did say that he's desperate, and some U.S. officials have suggested that Putin may not mentally be fully with it at this point. Former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice said that she sees a different Putin who, who seems erratic. What do you see? Well, he might pretend this way. This is old tactics, you know, we grew up in the same time in the Soviet Union. If he is really mad, then, uh, I don't know, them, but, uh, you know, the, the nuclear, it, it's only called that there is one button. As far as I know, both in the United States and in Russia and other places, uh, there is a, a chain of command. 
So yes, president gives command, but there is no threat which justifies not only nuclear war, but any war. Mm -hmm. hey, let's talk about the sanctions for a moment. As more Russians start feeling the impacts, do you think that there is a chance that the people could turn against them, that the Russians would turn their backs? And, and would that even be a concern for Putin? Definitely. Sanctions are biting, and they will be biting. People will realize that their sons are dying there, that bad news, and they will realize, like we realized in the Soviet Union, that there are uh, less and less goods in the stores and the, the prices are skyrocketing. And that will happen now much quicker. Uh, I mean, it's already happening today and tomorrow. I, I mean, uh, people are losing money. Uh, Russia totally dependent on dollar and uh, uh, euro. That's why Europe was so important. But I am just curious, how do you see this playing out in the end, and, and what might be the timeline? How long will Russians be able to, to go along with this? As you say, that the prices are going up and the, the food is running out. It depends on the West. If, if the West continues what they, what, uh, they are doing, uh, giving weapons in the first place, and keeping uh, strict sanctions, and would not bow to those empty threats from Moscow, it will be much sooner than probably we all uh, can expect because it's biting. All right. Former Russian Foreign Minister Andrei Kozarev, we thank you so much for your time tonight. Really appreciate you joining us. Thank you. The crisis in Ukraine comes as President Biden prepares to deliver his State of the Union address tomorrow night. And for more on that, ABC's senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce joins us now. Mary, how much is President Biden having to retool his speech in light of Russia's invasion on Ukraine? Well, quite a bit, Lindsay. I think there's no question that the speech you are going to hear tomorrow night will be pretty different from the one the president was probably originally envisioning just a few weeks ago. We are told he is obviously going to focus quite a bit on the crisis in Ukraine. We can expect him to highlight the steps he's taken so far to fight back against Vladimir Putin and this Russian invasion and to support the Ukrainian people, the steps they have taken to support and boost them up as well. He is also likely to tout the steps that the U.S. has taken to really rally the West, to present this united front and the moves that the U.S. has made to rally really the world to protect democratic values against this Russian aggression. And for many Americans, of course, inflation, economy are very much top of mind. How does the president plan to tackle that tomorrow? He's facing some very real challenges here at home. Everything from rising gas prices, inflation, the rising cost of groceries, and of course trying to turn the page on this pandemic. I think you can expect the president to tout the steps that he has taken to try and grow the economy. He's likely to talk a lot about that big infrastructure bill that he passed. But there is no question the president is facing some very real challenges. This is a tough time for him. He's going into this speech with a 37% approval rating. That is the lowest of his presidency so far, Lindsay. Mary Bruce reporting in from the White House. Thanks so much, Mary. Thank you. And we'll have full coverage and analysis of President Biden's State of the Union address tomorrow night right here on ABC News Live. When we come back, the sobering new climate report, what you need to know. They were legendary fighters in the ring, and now the Klitschko brothers are fighting for their nation, one of them mayor of Kyiv. But up next, the fringe far-right neo-Nazi extremists that have been fighting on both sides of the Ukrainian conflict for years. Putin's call to denazify Ukraine was a false flag, but, but there are some very real concerns. Stay with us. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people squeezing, squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Okay. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? 
GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it. Serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Christopher Steele, the guy who picked a fight with two presidents, and he's lived to tell the tale. That now infamous dossier. Supposedly a tape showing prostitutes hired by Donald Trump urinating on a bed. and would be quite a tape if it in fact existed. I said take out the PP tape. It quickly became a question of how much of this was accurate. This is the stuff of movies. A lot of this is the stuff of movies. <laughs> the story of epic proportions. Phony stuff. It's a bunch of crap. It changed history. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Welcome back. In recent years, Ukraine has relied on local, local militia groups to bolster its defenses against pro-Russian separatists, but some are reportedly tied to Ukrainian far-right political movements and include neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and other fascists in their fighting ranks. Even though they are a minority, their involvement has empowered Putin to spread the false message that the goal of his invasion is what he calls denazification. This despite Ukraine's elected government having the support of the U.S. and other Western democracies. According to the U.S. government, a small but growing number of American extremists have been traveling abroad to fight with far-right militants on both sides of the conflict, and some fear they could return to the U.S. more violent. ABC's David Scott and our investigative team traveled to Ukraine last spring to meet one former U.S. Army soldier accused of doing just that. I still have my moments. Sometimes I'll just break out and cry. For almost four years now, Angie Crowder has been waiting for her sister's killers to be brought to justice. They ripped my guts out. We all want answers. Gone down in the middle of the night, the murders of Angie's sister, Dina Lorenzo, and Dina's husband, Danny, have since become entangled with the crisis in Ukraine. I want their story told. These were two fun-loving people, and their life was snuffed. After growing up on a farm in Oklahoma, Dina joined the Marines, where she served honorably before moving to Florida to serve fellow vets. She worked at the Veterans Center in Tampa, mm. and uh, she helped vets. Uh -huh. uh, if she seen a homeless vet, she'd give him a card mm. and say, call me, I will help you. Dina married fellow veteran Seraphin Danny Lorenzo and lived a quiet life until the night of April 9th, 2018. I tried calling her that Monday night. And she didn't call you back? No. That was unusual? Yeah. I had this really strange feeling, kind of like when you know tornadoes are closer. Yeah. My hair stands up on the back of my neck. To make ends meet, Danny sometimes bought and sold goods online. That evening, investigators say, he responded to an ad offering several firearms and agreed to meet the seller. They changed locations on them constantly until they found one that was dark, no cameras, not a lot of lights. Roughly 40 minutes later, Danny and Dina pulled their red truck into this empty church parking lot and directly into an ambush. Local residents reported a sudden hail of rapid gunfire. 
And when it stopped, the victim's vehicle was riddled with bullet holes. 63 bullet casings were recovered by police. Dina Lorenzo was shot 11 times. Her husband, Danny, took seven rounds. When you think about your sister's last moments, that must be... She scared me. I know she had to be, you know? But it would be more than a year before authorities announced the suspects. Two former U.S. Army soldiers who were discharged. This is 22-year-old Alex Weifelhofer and 29-year-old Craig Lang. The two met in the Ukraine fighting in a far-right military group. And they called me and told me they had good news. They now know who did it. One was in custody, and they're trying to get the other one. I go, where's he at? And she goes, Ukraine. I go, wow, really? Last spring, as Russia began remobilizing on Ukraine's border, ABC News traveled to Ukraine and found Craig Lang living openly in Kiev with his new Ukrainian wife and child. He agreed to sit down with us, but refused to answer any questions about the murders in Florida, in which he denies any involvement. I can't discuss any of these things, anything about Florida, pretty much anything about my time in the United States in 2018. I can't talk about any of that. U.S. authorities are trying to extradite Lang to face murder charges, but Lang claims he's a victim of Russian propaganda and U.S. political persecution. A lot of the media goes around with saying that I'm a right-wing extremist, that I'm, you know, a Nazi or any of these things, and I feel that I'll be persecuted as being a right-wing extremist or a far-right person, even though I'm not. You're saying that, uh, that the, the extradition um, request by the U.S. is really not about the case that, um, that the government alleges. Yeah. I believe that the United States government intends to prosecute me and other veterans of this conflict here for our service in Ukraine. Lang is among the reportedly growing number of Americans who have gone to fight for far-right paramilitary organizations in Ukraine. During Russia's 2014 invasion in Crimea, Ukraine's army was in disarray and turned for help to civilian-formed volunteer battalions, some of them tied to fringe far-right political parties. We are starting to see uh, racially motivated violent extremists connecting with like-minded individuals overseas online, certainly. FBI Director Christopher Wray has repeatedly warned about Ukraine's far-right militias' appeal to U.S. domestic extremists and the possibility that they could return to the U.S. more radical and violent. Putin chose to falsely claim Ukraine's far right is not a minority fringe, but actually controls the government, using this lie as a pretext for war, claiming he's trying to rid the country of Nazis, despite the fact that Ukraine's elected president is Jewish. And Russia has its own extremist militias fighting alongside Russian-backed separatists in Ukraine including the Russian imperial movement, which has cultivated ties with American neo-Nazis and reportedly offered to train white nationalists at the far-right rally in Charlottesville. One important thing to understand about white power and militant right groups is that they are fundamentally opportunistic. So when we have a major sort of point of tension like we're seeing in the Ukraine right now, um, it's very, very likely that actors will exploit that tension. Lang first arrived in Ukraine around 2015. His six-year U.S. Army infantry career had come to an end after he went AWOL from his Texas base armed and drove 1,800 miles to North Carolina, where he was arrested for brandishing a gun near his ex-wife's house, according to local police. Did you leave the base and go AWOL intending to harm her? No. So I left the base. So I did go leave to clear my head. So I did actually go to try to see my son. And there was an altercation with a neighbor in which I was, you know, arrested for assault by pointing a gun. The army discharged Lang roughly a year later, but he quickly found a new front line to fight on in Ukraine, fighting with far right militias like Right Sector and the Asov Battalion. Militias accused of human rights abuses by Amnesty International with ties to U.S. domestic extremist groups. 
These groups like Adam Laffin and Rise Above Movement are tied to plots of violence back in the United States, sometimes mass casualty plots, um, and sometimes smaller acts of violence back home. He explained to Ukraine Today's correspondent Andrei Sapolienko his experience fighting the Russian-backed separatist forces. In 2016, Ukraine Today shadowed Lang as he fought Russian-backed separatists. I came to Ukraine to come and help the Ukrainian people. Lang has downplayed the role of white supremacists and neo-Nazis in Ukrainian militias and denies being an extremist himself. But can be seen here in this 2016 photo beside a right sector member giving a Heil Hitler salute. But well, you're well aware that, that there are far right ideologies represented in the, in the mix, right? I'm going to say that the amount of like neo-Nazis or people with extreme views is very, very minimal. Very, very minimal. Is, is there extremism to a small degree? There might be some extremism, yeah. There might be. There might. You, you don't accept that that's part of I the don't, reality? No, I don't accept that that's part of a reality here. I mean, I've, I've had black people in my unit serving alongside with me. Have you also had Nazis? Um, I've seen people that want to claim that they might be a Nazi, but I don't think that that's their actual ideology. It was in Ukraine that Lang met co-combatant and alleged co-conspirator Alex Zwiffelhofer, fighting against Russian-backed separatists in disputed territory on the Eastern Front. According to federal prosecutors, the following year they returned to the U.S. together and allegedly hatched the plot to rob and kill the Lorenzos in Florida. Zwiffelhofer has pleaded not guilty. Lang left the U.S. and eventually went back to Ukraine, where he says he now teaches English. During our interview, Lang grew increasingly upset with questions we were asking. I don't really, yeah, I don't, I don't see this conversation going anywhere. I see y'all well, are on a witch hunt trying to look well, that, for Nazis that true. don't exist. That's not true and that's not fair. And after speaking with us for more than an hour, when we pressed him about racist hey, statements reportedly made by Andrei Beletsky, the former leader of a Sov battalion, Lang ended the interview. But when you served in Ukraine, he was the commander for Assad, right? He says the nation's mission was to, quote, lead the white races of the world in a final crusade against Semite-led... I wish you all a good evening. I'm gonna humans. go ahead and leave. Is that not, is that not I'm true? Sorry, guys. I have no We've been unable to speak directly with Lang since that day, but prior to Russia's full-scale attack on Kiev, Lang's lawyer told us he would continue to resist U.S. extradition and may take up arms again in the fight against Russia. It's disturbing. We showed Angie Crowder our video of Lang's life prior to the attack on Kiev. A bitter pill as she waits for justice. What do you think about that? <sighs> well, I would like to see him come back and stay in charges. There's still a, there's still a danger. Our thanks to David for that. Still ahead here on Prime, we're tracking other headlines like, is there any hope of saving this baseball season? Who came out on top at the SAG Awards? And as you can imagine, so much in this newscast is focused on Ukraine. And up next, we'll take a look at the battles for that nation's first and second largest cities by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day from the Vice Prime Minister of Ukraine thanking Elon Musk for Starlink terminals, which are aimed at keeping that nation online during the war. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time in the 70s. You had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. We have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. 
plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. He put his family himself in jeopardy for us. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Welcome back, everyone. The two largest cities in Ukraine, the capital city of Kyiv, as well as Kharkiv on Ukraine's eastern border, have managed to fend off the assault by Russian forces so far, but with concerns that one or both cities could still fall. Tonight, we take a look at Kyiv and Kharkiv by the numbers. About 3 million people live in Kyiv, which covers 324 square miles, making it the largest city in all of Ukraine and also one of the largest capitals in Europe. Kyiv has been said to have been founded as far back as 482 AD in comparison and Moscow's founding dates back to 1147. The city's historic St. Sophia Cathedral was built in the 11th century and is today one of the city's most famous landmarks and UNESCO World Heritage Site. Kiev has gone through different hands throughout its history, but 31 years ago with the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991, Ukraine voted to become independent and Kiev has been the capital city ever since. With some one and a half million residents, Kharkiv is the second largest city in Ukraine. It was first founded around 1654 as a military outpost and was the first capital of the new Soviet Republic of Ukraine from 1920 to 1934, according to the Washington Post. Located just 25 miles from Russia's border, the city has faced massive bombardments and some of the most fierce street fighting in recent days, as a largely Russian-speaking residents there have put up surprisingly strong resistance to Russian forces. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. The seismic shift continues in the fight against COVID. More mandates falling from coast to coast and our look at two brothers fighting to save their country but first look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com it was an extraordinary story a computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence they let him turn himself into jail with no escort no one thought he would run how do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. Breaking news overnight. Your money and concerns about inflation. The pandemic is not over. The stories people are talking about. You don't want to shave your legs? Don't. I was gonna say. And what to expect in the day ahead. From the top of the world, baby! ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Weekday morning starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 7 there for you with one touch the abc news app download it now she was diva drama money and fame shaw amazing the prime housewife then suddenly we've seen a lot of things on the real housewives but we've never seen anyone be arrested unpredictable rich woman sign me up Mommy. this is what being live is Three all seconds. about this is abc news live 
right, we're gonna move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by no people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Oh. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. A growing number of states are now easing off of the mask mandates. It comes after the CDC updated its guidance, saying more than 70% of the population is living in communities with low to moderate risk, and they can ditch their mask indoors, including inside schools. New York Governor Kathy Hochul announcing the statewide masking requirement for schools will end Wednesday. My friends, the day has come. California, Oregon, and Washington following close behind, moving from mask requirements to mask recommendations in schools. Delaware doing away with its mask rules four weeks earlier than originally planned. In Washington, D.C. today, jury selection getting underway in the first trial linked to the January 6th Capitol insurrection. Guy Wesley Reffitt of Texas is accused of bringing a gun onto Capitol grounds, interfering with police officers who were guarding the building, and threatening his own children, who were teenagers at the time, if they reported him to authorities. The Capitol insurrection is one of the largest and most complicated investigations ever undertaken by the Justice Department, and experts say a lot of the cases currently in the pipeline could hinge on the outcome of this trial. The window to slow climate change is rapidly closing. That warning today from a new UN report urging immediate action to prevent the damage from getting worse. I've seen many scientific reports in my time, but nothing like this. That report paints a dire picture of our ongoing environmental crisis. It details multiple threats such as extreme weather, drought, and fire that have already disrupted life and ecosystems. Now, the report calls for drastic changes in the next decade decade to prevent irreversible damage. That will require the world to cut emissions by 45% by 2030 and achieve net zero emissions of greenhouse gases by 2050. But according to current commitments, global emissions are set to increase almost 14% over the current decade. And despite those warnings, the Supreme Court is hearing a case that could limit the EPA's ability to combat climate threats. A deadline for Major League Baseball as owners and players negotiate. If there's no deal by the end of the day, regular season games will start getting canceled. The battle over a number of issues, many of them dealing with compensation for players. At the heart of the problems, player pay has gone down for the last four years while the industry revenues have grown. If the two sides do not reach a deal by today, players will lose more than $20 million in salary for every day the season is canceled. The 30 teams would lose even more than that. And former New York Yankees legend Derek Jeter is stepping down as the CEO of the Miami Marlins after four and a half years. The 47-year-old former All-Star shortstop says he will also no longer be a shareholder in the club. In a statement, Jeter said that through hard work, trust, accountability, we transformed every aspect of the franchise, reshaped the workforce, and developed a long-term strategic plan for success. The team made the postseason in 2020, but had the worst record in the National League in the four seasons that Jeter was on the board as CEO. All right, and the actor goes to Coda. <laughs> With the feel-good Coda winning for Best Motion Picture cast, alongside deaf actor Troy Kotzer's historic supporting male actor triumph, Sunday Night SAG Awards giving a serious shake-up to next month's Oscar races. I'm going to teach you one thing. Do this. This is I Love You. The night leaning into audience-pleasing productions and performances. And the actor goes to Will Smith. One of the greatest moments of my career just now. Um, because my name was called for King Richard sitting next to Venus Williams. Winning for female lead actor and now positioned as an Academy Award frontrunner in what's been a wide open category, Jessica Chastain. Jesus, Bringing the life of the televangelist to the movies with the eyes of Tammy Faye. It was a dream of mine to play Tammy Faye. There were several acknowledgments and calls for support for Ukraine. Sending our thoughts, prayers and hopes for impending peace. 
Welcome back. Now to the story of two Ukrainian brothers who quite literally fought their way to the top of the heavyweight boxing world as their talents now take on a very different opponent, the Russians. ABC's Patrick Rievel brings us this report on the Klitschko brothers. Vitaly Klitschko was a decorated heavyweight champion. And that is a great performance for Vitaly Klitschko. And now, he's the mayor of Kyiv, at the helm in a very different fight for his country. Kyiv, until a few days ago, a relaxed, vibrant capital, is now a city facing a siege from Russian military forces, seeing the early signs of a potential humanitarian crisis. Supply lines are disrupted, meaning shortages for both food and medicine. These patients are waiting in the basement of a children's hospital, afraid to leave for fear that outside only worse awaits them. We are running out of food. Local charity funds promise to bring some. We are waiting for them to come and bring us bread, essentials and some juice for children. But despite facing tens of thousands of approaching Russian troops, residents are taking up arms to defend their city. Ordinary people lining up to pick up assault rifles, anti-tank grenades. Mayor Klitschko is helping organize the defense with one message for the Russians. Go back home. You have nothing to find here. Klitschko, along with his brother Vladimir, who was also a heavyweight champion, has vowed to defend Ukraine. Once fighting for glory, now they're in the fight for their city and country. Five years apart, both brothers dominated the sport, with Vitaly becoming world champion in 1999 and Vladimir in 2000. Although as a promise to their mother, they've never fought each other. They both earned PhDs in sports science, getting them the nicknames Dr. Steelhammer and Dr. Iron Fist. Vitaly retired after a 13-fight winning streak in 2012, deciding to enter into the world of politics, eventually becoming mayor of Kyiv in 2014, for their pleading with the international community for aid and more sanctions. Don't let it happen, continue happening in Ukraine. Don't let it happen in Europe and eventually in the world. With more Russian forces continuing to advance towards Kyiv, the brothers are trying to rally the defense, sending out messages through their social media accounts, reminding Ukrainians of their strength. We will overcome our thanks to Patrick for that. And before we go tonight, our image of the day. And this one comes courtesy of our prime producer, Nate Luna, who is reporting in from Poland. He and Phil Lipoff have been witnessing just heartbreaking scenes of families being separated by this conflict. Mothers and their children clinging to each other, holding on to what they can in the midst of so much uncertainty. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. hour we'll stay on top of the crisis in Ukraine we speak with Senator Mark Warner we break down how the Europeans are dealing with the crisis and we're on the ground as more refugees flood into neighboring countries stay with us ABC News America's number one news source Powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. 
You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to say. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck, and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out. Unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently, and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. The White House has officially sent Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson's Supreme Court nomination to the Senate. It is the first time that a black woman has ever been nominated for a seat on the high court. Democrats have the votes to confirm Jackson without Republican support, but President Biden has said that he hopes to win over some members of the other party. The U.S. Supreme Court is considering a major challenge to the power of the Environment Protection Agency. West Virginia versus the EPA focuses on major coal and mining companies and the agency's authority that many see as critical to curbing the climate crisis. Experts say that the out outcome of the case could determine whether the U.S. will meet a government goal of shifting entirely to clean energy sources by 2035. A sweet deal for Neil Diamond. The singer became the latest artist to sell his entire music catalog. Diamond, Diamond, famous for hits like Sweet Caroline, sold his songs to Universal Music Group for an undisclosed amount. The deal includes 110 unreleased tracks, including a full album. Musicians like Bob Dylan, Bruce Springsteen, and Stevie Nicks have all recently done the same. And now to the latest on Russia's war in Ukraine, where Ukrainian fighters are bravely holding off Russian forces for longer than many anticipated. But Russia is still on the move, threatening Ukraine's capital as casualties mount on both sides and more refugees flee to the borders. And in Russia, the cost of the war is rising as well as the economic sanctions hit hard. We have team coverage tonight from the region, and we begin with ABC's Ian Panel once again reporting in from Kyiv. Tonight, Russian shells pummeling a residential neighborhood in Kharkiv, the second largest city in Ukraine. Officials there saying dozens of civilians were killed in potentially the worst single attack of this war. Human Rights Watch accusing the Russians of using cluster bombs on the city. If verified, a deliberate attack on civilian areas would be a war crime. Ceasefire talks between Ukraine and Russia on the border with Belarus ended after six hours with no deal, but an agreement to try to meet again in the coming days. With a Russian advance slowed by a fierce Ukrainian defense, there are fears Putin will intensify his attacks, already raising tensions with the West even higher by putting Russia's nuclear forces on heightened alert. President Biden answered with one word when asked today if Americans should be worried about nuclear war. Mr. President, should Americans be worried about nuclear war? No. The Pentagon says Russia still has significant combat power, but has met stiff resistance from the Ukrainians. It's clear the Russians have not made the progress that they wanted to make by day five. New satellite images today show a miles-long column of Russian armed vehicles and tanks just 70 miles from the center of Kyiv. But Putin's army being met head on. The Ukrainians releasing this drone video from outside of the capital claiming to have knocked out part of the Russian column, burned out vehicles littering the roads around Kyiv. And north of the city, these locals reportedly stopping a Russian tank from entering their village. In Kharkiv this weekend, Ukrainian forces battled Russian troops in the streets, even forcing them to retreat in a relentless defense of the city. But in the south, Russians appear to be advancing on the strategic Black Sea port of Mariupol. Heartbreaking images emerging there of some of the youngest casualties of this war. Here, a nine-year-old girl lies in the back of an ambulance as a medic races to save her life. It was too late. 
At least 16 children have already been killed in the fighting, which officials say has claimed over 350 lives in all. After rallying his fighters over the weekend, Ukrainian President Zelensky today praising the heroic defense being put up by his army and the country's citizen soldiers, saying Ukrainians have shown who we are. Russia has shown what it's become. He later signed an application to join the European Union. It's a symbolic move that could take years to pass. Even so, it's a message of defiance to Putin. And around the world, outrage at this brutal invasion is only growing. The UN General Assembly held its first emergency session in decades. Officials warning they're preparing for up to 4 million refugees from Ukraine in coming days and weeks. Well, we're here in one of the main train stations in Kiev, and you can see the crush and the desperation of people desperate to get out of a city, fearing that it could come under siege from the Russians at any time. French President Macron calling Putin today, who reportedly agreed to hold all strikes on civilians. But there's no evidence that's happening from a man who also said he wasn't going to invade in the first place. In Belarus, to Ukraine's north, American diplomats could be seen taking down the flag at the embassy in Minsk today, which is now suspending operations. And in the capital, tensions rising with every passing hour. Volodymyr Tkachuk, a former soldier, picking up his ammunition in defense of his country. Do you have javelins here? Oh, okay, <laughs> secrets. But, but, it, but they're very... They're, for you, tactically, javelins are helpful. Ian Panel joins us tonight once again from Kyiv. Ian Zelensky has urged the U.S. and NATO to impose a no-fly zone over significant parts of the country. Explain why that's not likely to happen. Yeah, that's right, Lindsay. It's actually something that I keep hearing repeatedly on the ground. It's something that I've heard in other conflicts because, of course, that would try and balance the equation between the two military forces because it would limit Russia's ability to conduct aerial operations. But the White House is ruling it out, and here's why. Because they've said that they would not want to deploy U.S military. Uh, and if you're having a no-fly zone, then, of course, U.S. military would have to be deployed to the area, and you would need support staff, and that would mean them potentially flying over Ukraine. And here is the second, even biggest risk. It would run a significant risk of a potential direct conflict with Russian forces. Again, that's something that President Biden, the White House, the administration has been very clear is not going to happen. Lindsay? Right. Makes sense. All right. Ian Panel, thanks so much as always. From diplomacy to how this is all unfolding on the ground, ABC News contributor and retired Colonel Steve Ganyard joins us now. And Steve, Russian President Vladimir Putin put Russia's nuclear forces on a state of heightened alert, as you know, this weekend. Just a few hours ago, President Biden said that Americans should not be worried about a th the threat of nuclear war. But what kind of message is Putin sending with this move? Is this a bluff? <laughs> I sure hope so, Lindsay. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he has tried to bluff us before, and there are those of us, as you and I know, that uh, thought it was a bluff, and uh, so maybe now we don't take it as a bluff. Anytime anybody rattles the nuclear saber, it's in designed to induce fear. Uh, and fear, in this case, signals that Mr. Putin feels like he is losing. Um, the interesting thing about the language here, uh, not to get too far in the weeds, but the way that they wrote the language, it doesn't seem applicable to any previous language that the Russians have used. You know, everybody in the State Department and, and at the Pentagon wants to see language they understand. And so there's sort of a lingua franca of diplomacy. And what Putin said was like, it just doesn't make sense. There's no way to correlate that to what he actually did. So probably there just to create fear uh, and, and we should probably take it seriously in that sense that he feels that trapped and that far behind. And new satellite images reveal the Russian military convoy that left southern Belarus toward Kyiv stretches on for miles. What does that tell you? Uh, it tells us that they've sort of been pulling back today and that they are looking to reinforce and then commit more of their troops. So <clears throat> about two-thirds of their troops have been committed. That means inside of Ukraine. But what they really need to do now is bring those troops to bear. And so this is obviously quite worrying because uh, that much armor uh, and that many troops are going to really test the Ukrainians in a way that they haven't been tested before. So tomorrow will be a very, very uh, important day for the Ukrainian defense.
And, and we've been talking about this analogy of, of David versus Goliath. It, it seems like so far that, that slingshot being pretty effective. How do you think that the Ukraine has been able to, to put up such a resistance so far? Yeah, well, it's, it's a lot easier when you're defending your homeland and that you are righteous. And that's what the Ukrainians are here. And the uh, Russians are the aggressors and they're uh, and they're they're not holding the moral high ground. So <clears throat> something like that is, is uh, as Napoleon would, would say, the moral is to the uh, physical uh, like three to one. And so that ability for for the uh, Ukrainians to say this is this is ours. This is our homeland that we're defending. Uh, that helps. But it also helps that NATO is pumping in a whole bunch of military uh, 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 material that will be useful. So anti-tank weapons, anti-aircraft weapons, small arms, uh, ammo, all the things that the Ukrainians would need uh, is coming in. Hopefully it's fast enough and it's in time. Uh, this morning, a senior Defense Department official said that they have seen no indication that Belarusian forces are prepared <clears throat> to join Russia. But according to an internal State Department report, the president of Belarus seems to be getting ready for a more active role. Why does this conflict matter to Belarus and how significant would it be if that country got heavily involved? Yeah, Lindsay, this is really interesting. Uh, when nobody was looking, Mr. Putin has basically turned Belarus into a vassal state, just what he wants to do with Ukraine. <clears throat> so the Belarusians uh, are now going to do what Mr. Putin wants, and that uh, is to change their constitution and say, sure, we want nuclear weapons on our soil. So think about that. We will now, be, uh, Mr. Putin will now have the ability to put nuclear weapons on the border of a major NATO ally, namely Poland. That's like if he put nuclear weapons in Cuba. Uh, how it would be to the U.S. So, uh, so uh, the leadership in Belarus has become Mr. Putin's puppet. And so anything that goes on from now on is only at Putin's direction. And it's also important to note who is doing the fighting for Russia. Explain to us who's taking up the arms there and, and why that matters for Putin and the story that he's trying to sell his people. Yeah, one of the interesting uh, news releases, press releases we saw out of the Russian Ministry of Defense today was the first headline was, these are not conscripts, these are professional military, Russian military fighting. That's important because about a third, about 260,000 uh, troops within Putin's military are conscripts, meaning that they're draftees, meaning that the mothers of Russia are giving Mr. Putin their sons and daughters. And so the idea here is that if he commits those, those conscripts, those draftees to combat and these children start coming home in body bags, he loses support not only in internationally, but he loses it at home. And it's bad enough that the sanctions and the sanctioning of the central bank are beginning to bite and we're seeing the, the ruble tank. Uh, and in this case, he can't afford to lose the mothers of Russia. And so he's keeping the conscripts out and putting the professional military in as a way to maintain support at home. Steve Ganyard, always appreciate you joining us on the show. Thanks, Lindsay. Fear, dread, despair, those are just some of the flurry of feelings being felt by hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians trying to make a mad dash out of their homeland. Women not knowing if they'll ever see their husbands again as children shed tears. While they may be young, they're certainly old enough to understand why their fathers are staying behind to fight. Our Matt Gutman has the very latest on the Ukrainian refugee crisis. In Ukraine tonight, this little girl on the train, sobbing into her stuffed animal, just one of the more than 500,000 people leaving everything behind, fleeing in crammed trains, and cars and buses log jammed for dozens of miles, tens of thousands on foot, dragging bags, clutching their children. The hub of the biggest, fastest displacement of people since World War II was Lviv. We were at the station this morning as that train to Poland clanked in. Thousands packed into the tunnels, standing on the stairs, documents in hand, bags at the ready for their chance. <laughs> Authorities handing out food, which was passed back hand to hand down the stairs. With men of fighting age banned from leaving, it was the very young and very old. The majority, women and children. Yesterday, there weren't enough trains. This is absolute no, chaos. There is no scheduled train. The possible, maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow morning, maybe in two days. Today, the trains did arrive, but very few men from any country allowed on. We've been watching this group of South Asians and Africans try to get on this train. They keep getting pushed back. They're told only women and children told to wait their turn, but they've been here for days. Their turn hasn't come. 
The routes out of this country littered with sorrow and fear. This boy on the road to the border. He takes a breath because what he's about to say was so hard. Papa Back on that train platform, the doors close, that little girl still crying. Her mother crying too. I was told they're leaving the girl's father behind. That hand on the window, those tears, the language of exile. You know, Lindsay, once these people get to Poland, many of them are staying with Ukrainian acquaintances or friends or family. Uh, there's a pretty sizable Ukrainian community that lives in Poland previous to the invasion. Now, a lot of people are asking, what do these refugees need? I asked the UN. They said they have three priorities. The first, warm clothes, blankets, sleeping bag. The second priority, accommodation, getting them a place to stay over the next few nights. The third priority, getting them back home soon. Now, we've put an article together with a list of resources. Uh, it's up right now on abcnews.com for anyone who wants to help. Lindsay. Just heart-wrenching goodbyes, Matt. Thank you. Russia is quickly feeling the impact of sanctions hitting the country, with the U.S. now freezing assets of Russia's central bank and the Russian ruble crashing in value. As Russians feel the economic pinch, though, is Vladimir Putin feeling any pressure? ABC's James Longman reports in from Moscow tonight. Tonight, Russia is feeling the shock of Western sanctions, growing increasingly isolated from the world, a nation beginning to suffer for one man's war. The wave of economic measures unrelenting, Switzerland announcing it will break from its tradition of neutrality to freeze Russian assets, and the U.S. now targeting Russia's central bank. Long lines at some banks and ATMs, many anxious to withdraw cash as the ruble sinks further against the dollar. And a growing fear of skyrocketing prices, Russia's central bank even closing the stock market early to avoid a crash. But still today, Putin defiant, calling the West an empire of lies. Ordinary Russians are already starting to see their lives change because of sanctions. But Vladimir Putin could probably convince them that it's the West's fault. But what about those closest to him, the elite, the ones who've benefited from the luxurious perks of modern Russian life? Do they really want to follow Vladimir Putin down this apparent path towards economic misery? All of this coming as Europe closes its airspace to Russian aircraft. With far fewer flights, the U.S. is now telling its citizens to leave Russia immediately. And tonight, in response, Russia is banning airlines from 36 countries. The international outrage is growing. Soccer's governing bodies banning Russia from the World Cup and all competitions. Shell Oil announcing it will quit all its Russian operations. That follows BP, who divested its nearly 20% stake in the country's key oil company, Rosneft. FedEx and UPS are also halting all shipments into the country. Google and Facebook's parent company Meta also blocking Russian state media from receiving money for ads. The potential for unrest in Russia, high, with riot police flooding the streets and more than 5,000 people arrested in anti-war protests so far. The thought of closing Russia off and rolling back 30 years of progress since the Cold War, unthinkable to many Russians. Russians starting to feel those changes already. James Longman joins us now from Moscow. And James, Putin has been isolated during the pandemic. What do we know about his inner circle and who he's trusting right now and, and whether they're standing with him on this invasion? It is so hard to know anything about what actually goes on in the buildings behind me here at the Kremlin. The sense is that he is really rather isolated. Every picture that we see of him is meant to show uh, the public that this is a man doing things on his own. There was a picture released today of discussing the economic sanctions that have been placed on Russia. He was sitting one end of a table, his advisors all the way down the other end. There is an inner circle. Uh, Sergei Shogu, who is the defense minister, is known to be quite close to Vladimir Putin. Before the pandemic, there was out seen uh, hunting together. Um, he is also a kind of Cold War veteran. And that's the thing. There are other individuals, the head of the, head of the FSB, the spy service here, or the, the secretary of the Security Council. All of these individuals are thought to be close to Putin, but they are also kind of relics of the Cold War. They have this same Cold War mentality, and they probably would drag Russia down this path into isolation because it's all they've ever known 
and it's because it's, it's kind of they can't afford for the war in Ukraine to go wrong. I mean, the, the, the really th sort of worrying thing about this whole thing is it's, it's kind of Ukraine or Putin. That's the choice Russia has at the moment. And so uh, the people around him, really, they're in the same boat, Lindsay. And we're also seeing the dramatic impact of economic sanctions on Russia. Just describe how that's being felt by regular Russians right now in their everyday lives. Look, the economic sanctions are starting to hit Russia. It's kind of a slow burn. Uh, in, first of all, though, the, the, the hit on the ruble has been quite shocking, and so a lot of there's been this kind of gradual run on the banks. We've had something like $10 billion. It's probably much more than that now, uh, withdrawn by Russians who were just worried about, uh, you know, their incomes and being able to have currency that they can actually use. Hyperinflation could hit here, and that's why the government has raised interest rates to try to stave that off. We've seen a lot of people go out to try to buy uh, electronics because that's the thing that kind of the, the prices normally rocket during uh, during these sorts of periods of sanctions in in Russia, and and that's really goes to the heart of this. Russia has seen sanctions put on it before. In 2014, when Vladimir Putin last invaded Ukraine, there were sanctions, but not at this level. And the difficulty Vladimir Putin is going to have is telling his people that this is worth the hardship, because I'm not sure that he expected these sanctions to be quite so harsh and the international community to be quite so united around them. He has cut off from uh, his uh, from funds that he has in the United States, the 630 billion he had in reserve, that was meant to pay for his war and help his country through a period of pretty harsh sanctions. Without that, with all the other measures that the West has taken and cutting this country off physically as well, it just feels as though uh, Russia's really going to head for some hardship and Putin doesn't need to keep people on side. This is not a democracy, but he likes to. Uh, and that might be difficult for him now. Lindsay? All right, James Longman for us in Moscow tonight. Thanks so much, James. We're joined now by the chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, Senator Mark Warner. Senator, thanks so much for joining us during this extremely busy time. Uh, the Russians seem to have been taken by surprise by the strength of the Ukrainian resistance so far, but we've certainly seen satellite images of a large convoy of Russian military equipment heading toward Kyiv. From the intelligence that you've seen, how concerned are you that Putin could still use overwhelming force by the Russian military in order to take the capital? Well, two or three things. One. I think we have gotten Putin off his game because the American intelligence was so correct about both the extent of the invasion and uh, got rid of any ability for Putin to claim that this was generated by the Ukrainians, number one. Number two, um, the Russians clearly underestimated the resistance and will to fight by the Ukrainians. And President Zelensky has become a world figure in terms of um, standing up for his country. Number three, um, nine days ago, I was in Munich uh, meeting with a lot of our NATO allies. And while they thought the invasion might start, they were still unsure how far they'd go on sanctions. And we have now seen sanctions on Nord Stream 2. We've seen sanctions directly against Putin himself. We've seen sanctions on the World Bank. We've seen the SWIFT uh, financial system literally help kick the Russians out. At this point, five, six days in, uh, the Russians are reeling a little bit. But as your, as your question pointed out, Russians still have overwhelming force. About a third of their troops have not been fully deployed. Um, I'm very concerned in terms of the capabilities in the cyber domain. Uh, the level of cyber attacks that we've seen so far have been relatively mild. We are ratcheting up the pressure in a way that's unprecedented. The Ukrainians are fighting back, but the Russians over the long term still have an overwhelming military and cyber advantage. And negotiations between Ukrainian and Russian officials ended, of course, today with no ceasefire, but with plans to continue talking in the near future. In your view, is there a scenario where Putin can back down from this from this fight? And, and if not, how far do you think that he'll, he'll try to take it? Well, that, that's the question. Where is there an an off-ramp for Putin. He's made unreasonable demands from the outset, somehow saying um, Ukraine could never join NATO. Ukraine has to give up on its democracy. We're going to go back to the pre the late 1990s on the formation around Europe. That's just not going to happen. I think he knew that, but he's not found an, an exit 
uh, ramp. And frankly, the idea that the Ukrainians, after this kind of resistance, would somehow recognize the breakaway republics in the east, I think is, uh, I think the chance of that, that will be the Ukrainians' decision. But I think the, the chances of that are, are quite, quite small. So we also could see in, in reaction to these massive sanctions, the Russians try to launch cyber attacks against NATO or against um, the United States. And suddenly all of the hypotheticals of what could constitute an Article 5 violation could move from the realm of hypothetical to real. Article 5 is when you attack a NATO nation, and that then requires all 30 NATO nations um, to respond. So we're still in for some, some choppy days ahead. Uh, Ukrainian President Zelensky has been pleading for more military aid from the West. Uh, we know that help is on the way, but what more could and should the U.S. do in order to provide Ukraine with additional support? Well, listen, I am, I am amazed at uh, President Zelensky's resilience and the Ukrainian people's resilience. But we had been urging President Zelensky for weeks on end to go ahead and mobilize all of his reserves. He only did that three days or in, into the fight. Um, so are there ability to get more arms in over land? Yes, and the fact is, it's not just coming from our, from our forward deployed um, arms, but all of the other NATO nations. But the amount of arms that will get in um, is not gonna stop the Russians, at least on the military, mil military front. But what I think Putin has to recognize is that even if he were able to defeat the Ukrainian military and take technical control of some of the larger cities in, in the center part and east of Ukraine, he's going to have an insurgency on his hands. All of these literally thousands of Ukrainian citizens who've been part of these territorial defense units, who've gotten weapons, um, they are not going to sit idly by even as as you, Russian troops try to patrol their cities. I mean. Uh, the Russians do not have nearly enough forces around Ukraine at this point to occupy a country of 44 million people. You know, we'd have to imagine that Putin is an extremely calculated person, but do you think at all that he miscalculated this invasion? How much resistance that he would face from the West and, and the impact that sanctions would have on his country? I believe he totally miscalculated. I think he thought he was going to walk in the way he did with Crimea a few years back. I think you know he only sent about a third of his forces in initially. There was no kind of shock and awe. He has not used his full cyber capabilities, which again, I have a grave concern about. Uh, and I think he expected the West to be splintered. And this is where I want to give President Biden credit. If we had acted arbitrarily or on our own, and I think that's what he expected. Uh, without European support, we would have split this alliance and he would be in much stronger position. This is also an indication, I believe, of a leader that has been autocratic for 20 years. He, he doesn't like to hear dissent. And any of the images that your viewers have seen of Putin over these last few weeks, you know, he's sitting on one end of the table, totally removed. This is an isolated guy who doesn't like to have anybody but sycophants telling him you know, exactly the things he wants to hear. You don't make independent judgments uh, with that kind of input. This is someone I think who has made a miscalculation, but he's also someone with enormous military power left, someone who's got um, huge amounts of cyber weapons to deploy and obviously nuclear weapons as well. Senator Mark Warner, we thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you. Still to come, the forceful diplomatic pushback to Russia and the rare UN meeting held today. And the alarming report about the climate conditions half of our world already faces. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. This is what being live is Three all dragons. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not them. afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. 
Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it. Serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Christopher Steele. The guy who picked a fight with two presidents. And he's lived to tell the tale. That now infamous dossier. Supposedly a tape showing prostitutes hired by Donald Trump urinating on a bed. It would be quite a tape if it in fact existed. I said take out the PP tape. It quickly became a question of how much of this was accurate. This is the stuff of movies. A lot of this is the stuff of movies. The story of epic proportions. Phony stuff. It's a bunch of crap. It changed history. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. This is the story of Elizabeth Holmes. You got intrigued, deceit, fantasy. It, it's all there. Can't peel your eyes away. Any comments, Elizabeth? Any comments, Elizabeth? God bless you, girl, boss. The new man in her life, the new baby. And now, as Elizabeth Holmes awaits sentencing, what you haven't seen, haven't heard. Behind the scenes, it was an absolute mess. My jaw dropped. Part of the human tree, being fascinated by a train wreck. I was blown away. The new 2020 Friday night on ABC. Another headline coming out of the developments in Ukraine is the full court press that we're seeing by the leaders of the EU as Putin is being hit from all angles at this point as France continues to try to reason with him via diplomatic means. ABC's Inez de la Cuetara is tracking it all for us. Inez? Hey, Lindsay. Yeah, and we are really seeing the European Union stepping up here in support of Ukraine, with the EU announcing it'll be buying and delivering $500 million worth of weapons to Ukraine. That's the first time that's ever happened, and that's on top of the help that's already coming in from individual countries. The EU also deciding to ban all Russian planes from European airspace. It is also banning Russian state TV, and European leaders are actually currently meeting here in Paris tonight to figure out next steps. One of the things that's bound to come up is whether Ukraine should be allowed to join the EU. That's becoming a big point of debate here. You had the Ukrainian President Zelensky today saying he had signed an application for EU membership. He is calling for Ukraine to be granted EU membership immediately. Worth pointing out the process to join the EU is complicated. It could take years. It requires unanimous approval by all EU member states. And should Ukraine join the EU, that is something that's likely to anger Russia all the more. Now, we also saw a renewed push for diplomacy today. French President Macron speaking with Russian President Putin. According to the French president's office, Putin agreed to halt all strikes against civilians and to preserve civilian infrastructure. According to the Kremlin, Putin told Macron Russia is open to negotiations with Ukrainian representatives. However, Putin did say settlement would only be possible if Russia's security demands are met in full. And of course, that is something they have yet to reach a compromise on. But you did see Macron here once again trying to mediate. He is currently the only Western leader in touch with Putin, and the two men did agree to stay in contact. Lindsay? Inez, thank you. Joining us now for more is the spokesperson for the UN Secretary General, Stefan Dujaric. We thank you so much for your time tonight. Earlier today, the UN General Assembly convened just the 11th emergency meeting in its history. Let's take a listen to Ukraine's ambassador. If Ukraine does not survive, intention, survive, international peace will not survive. If Ukraine does not survive, the United Nations will not survive. Have no illusions.
If Ukraine does not survive, we cannot be surprised if democracy fails. Next. Fiery rhetoric there. Does he have a point? Well, this is clearly one of the most challenging times the United Nations has seen in decades. Uh, the charter is being tested. Uh, the charter is being uh, violated. Uh, but the UN is a resilient organization. Uh, from the Secretary General's point of view, his clear message to the Russian leader has been to stop the fighting and pull back his troops. Meanwhile, we as an organization are focusing on the humanitarian aid we can bring uh, to the millions of Ukrainians who do so desperately need it. And you said the humanitarian aid. Is that what you believe the role of the UN is in this conflict? Well, you know, the thing is, there are different kinds of UN. There's the UN of the member states that we see in the Security Council, that we see in the General Assembly. While those member states try to find common ground to actually get a political settlement, to get peace, we are moving. We are staying and delivering in Ukraine. We have colleagues in the eastern part of the country, throughout Ukraine, working in very difficult uh, conditions, trying to bring some help um, to those men, women, of children of Ukraine, and we—I mean, we've seen it from your reports. Uh, the devastation on the civilian population is just is catastrophic and heartbreaking. As long as Russia, though, has veto power on the UN Security Council, can the UN even be effective? Well, you know, there, there, it, there is a political statement, as in any anywhere. We we know what the situation is in the Security Council. We know uh, in the General Assembly, it's a different process it's a it's sending a message when when a resolution will actually uh, pass but we we in terms of the secretary general has no control over what the member states do so while they discuss uh, we keep calling obviously for increased dialogue we're happy to see that Ukrainians and Russians met today and we understand there'll be further meetings um, but our focus has to be on what we as uh, as staff of the UN can actually do today. And Stefan, as you know, Vladimir Putin put his country's nuclear forces on high alert. Today, President Biden said that Americans should not be worried about a nuclear war. But how did we get to this point in 2022 where we're now talking about nuclear weapons? Uh, clearly, the dangers of that go far beyond Ukraine's borders. Well, first of all, I mean, the, the, the mere mention of nuclear conflict is, is inconceivable. There's no there is no pretext or a reason to use nuclear weapons. I mean, how do we get there? If you want to take a step back, part of it has been the lack of progress in, um, in, in, in trying to eliminate uh, nuclear arsenals, something that we have been pushing uh, for a long time, uh, but there has just been very little progress. And in fact, uh, there's been a proliferation of nuclear technology throughout the world, which is extremely, uh, which is worrying and should be worrying. And let's talk about the humanitarian crisis that of course cannot be overlooked. The UN says that hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians are now on the move and this war could cost upwards of a billion, of billion dollars. Does Russia need to be held accountable for creating this crisis and also the Ukrainian residents who, who have lost and, and will still lose their lives? Well, it is clear that we need Russia to halt its military operations. Uh, what we're already seeing uh, on the border of Ukraine and its, its Western neighbors are hundreds of thousands of people leaving. It is critical that all of those European countries open their borders and give protection to people who are refugees, who are fleeing violence. And one thing I think we're, we're concerned about, we're seeing some reports of, of discrimination because obviously there are Ukrainians coming out, but there were, as there are in a lot of countries, there are other people who live in Ukraine. And we want to make sure that those people who may be um, from the Middle East, who may be from Africa, who happen to be in Ukraine and are trying to flee, are afforded the same protection uh, as Ukrainians as they seek shelter and safety in Western Europe. And lastly, I'd like to get your reaction to the other crisis making headlines today, the climate crisis. The main headline from the new UN climate report out today is delay means death. What do our leaders need to do right now to reverse course? Well, I think reverse course is exactly the right expression. Uh, what we want to see is uh, emissions cut by 45 percent by 2030. We want to get to zero, uh, net zero uh, by 2050. But the numbers that we're seeing now are in fact showing that emissions will rise. 
what we need to do is cut our addiction to coal, cut our addiction to fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are just bad for people, bad for planet. Um, we need to so change our energy supply. And we're seeing even if you look at the Ukraine crisis, the fact that so many parts of the world are reliant on, on uh, the, the gas that comes from Russia and through Ukraine to Europe instead of renewable energies is just making this crisis even worse. Stefan Dujarik, we thank you so much for your time tonight. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you so much. And in the midst of the war with Ukraine, as we just mentioned to the UN spokesperson, tonight the UN has sounded the alarm about a different existential crisis. What is happening to our planet? In a brand new report, hundreds of scientists spill out in excruciating detail how climate change is affecting nearly every aspect of, of our lives on this planet. They say it's not too late to change course, but we are running out of time. Our chief meteorologist, Ginger Z, reports. Delay means death. Tonight, a sobering call to action from the United Nations. I've seen many scientific reports in my time, but nothing like this. Our atmosphere today is on steroids, doped with fossil fuels. The stakes for our planet have never been higher. While the world watches the war in Ukraine, a group of scientists is warning about another threat, climate change. Today's IPCC report is an atlas of human suffering and a damning indictment of failed climate leadership. The UN warning the place we all call home, our planet, is getting clobbered by climate change. Climate change isn't lurking around the corner waiting to pounce. It's already, already upon us, raining down blows on billions of people. Our team has seen it, up close and personal on every continent. We're in the heart of what should be the pristine Amazon, and right over our shoulders is a sandstorm. That is just mind-boggling. Massive plastic pollution, deep erosion. Are you willing to take the Maldives as climate refugees? Nearly half of humanity is living in the danger zone now. Many ecosystems are at the point of no return now. The brand new UN report, a result of years of research from thousands of scientists. Their painful conclusion, humans and nature may be running out of ways to adapt to what's happening to our planet. Droughts, fires, weather extremes, all disrupting our lives and the ecosystems of the world that we all need to survive. One thing is that we do see a sharper picture of what the impacts of climate change are. And the report makes it clear that those impacts are more widespread and happening more quickly than we had thought previously. And if temperatures warm past 1.5 degrees Celsius, the consequences could be irreversible. This report really contains information that is, is a little bit like the parent yelling up the stairs, you're going to miss the bus. And for the first time, scientists warning about the possibly devastating mental health effects as well. Even if you're not directly in the crosshairs of a climate change impact, you are feeling the stress more. You know, we're seeing this especially with young people where they're aware that the world that they are inheriting um, is not their parents' world. The window for humanity to reverse the course rapidly closing. Starting today, every action, every choice, and every decision matters because each of them can take us away from or towards a climate-resilient, sustainable world. Viable solutions are on the table. Protecting nature, building with climate change in mind, and more money for vulnerable countries. If we start protecting people with the types of solutions that we're implementing now, rather than waiting until later, we are more likely to, to save money in the future, rather than trying to retrofit things that have already been built. But tonight, the warning is loud and clear. Humanity must act without delay. The choice should not be gloom and doom. The options are clear and the choices are clear. Now is the time to turn rage into action. Every fraction of the degree matters. Every voice can make a difference and every second counts. Our thanks to Ginger for that. And still to come, the seismic shift in the fight against COVID. We've heard so much about the men taking up arms in Ukraine, but what about the women who stayed behind? Stay with us. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. 
How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. Breaking news overnight. Your money and concerns about inflation. The pandemic is not over. The stories people are talking about. You don't want to shave your legs? Don't. I was gonna say. And what to expect in the day ahead. From the top of the world, baby! ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Weekday morning starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions. Straightforward reporting. No spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. This is the story of Elizabeth Holmes. You got intrigued, deceit, fantasy. It, it's all there. Can't peel your eyes away. Any comments, Elizabeth? Any comments, Elizabeth? God bless you, girl, boss. The new man in her life, the new baby. And now, as Elizabeth Holmes awaits sentencing, what you haven't seen, haven't heard. Behind the scenes, it was an absolute mess. My jaw dropped. Part of the human tree, being fascinated by a train wreck. I was blown away. The new 2020 Friday night on ABC. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Four seven, there for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. She was diva, drama, money and fame, shop amazing, the prime housewife. Then suddenly, we've seen a lot of things on The Real Housewives, but we've never seen anyone be arrested. Unpredictable rich woman. Sign me up. Mommy. This is what being live is Please all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're gonna move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Welcome back, everyone. States continue to make the move to drop their mask mandates across the country. And while some may celebrate, others remain hesitant. ABC Stephanie Ramos has the details. Tonight, across the country, more schools are dropping masks. California, Oregon, and Washington State jointly announcing they'll move from requiring to recommending masks in schools after March 11th. In Connecticut and Massachusetts, it was a big step for students like second grader Neil Hughes. When was the last time you were in school with no mask on? Uh, kindergarten. And New York's governor lifting the mask mandate in schools on Wednesday. My friends, the day has come. But more than a million students in New York City will need to wait until Friday to learn whether the mayor will end its school mask mandate next week. And tonight, new data from the height of the Omicron surge in New York suggests the Pfizer pediatric dose vaccine was less effective in 5 to 11-year-olds than the full-dose vaccine in teens and adults, providing minimal protection against infection a month after vaccination. But researchers stress the Pfizer vaccine still protected against severe disease, the most critical measure. So I think it's likely that um, that this could either be fixed by um, changing dose or giving a boost. 
Our thanks to Stephanie Ramos. We are tracking several headlines around the world. Tens of thousands were ordered to evacuate as heavy rain smashed Australia's east coast. At least nine people have been killed since the downpour began last Thursday. Several regions in Australia have already seen rainfall records for February broken, with some places getting more than a month's or more than a year's rain in one single day. Four months after the construction of the Chivo Pet Veterinary Hospital began on the outskirts of the capital of El Salvador, the medical facility opened its doors over the weekend. According to the government of El Salvador's president, the hospital was built with a Bitcoin fund of $4 million. The hospital has high-tech equipment and offers grooming services, ER 24-7 consultations, and other top-of-the-line veterinary services as a, at the symbolic cost of 25 cents per service paid for with Bitcoin. A vacation on the sunny beaches of Egypt's Red Sea has turned into a disaster for nearly 100 Ukrainian tourists who are now stuck following an all-out Russian assault of Ukraine. Ukrainian tourists gathered to watch the news with some crying and others thinking of the rough days ahead. Egypt said all tourists impacted by the ongoing assault and the closure of airspace over the two countries, whether Russian or Ukrainian, are allowed to stay in the hotels until they manage to fly back home safely to their countries. The ministry did not mention if the tourists would be charged for their extended stays. Though they are not required to fight, Ukrainian women are now a formidable force in the resistance against the Russian invasion, many stepping up to defend the nation and the people they so dearly love. Ariel Reshev has more. They are Ukraine's mothers, daughters, teachers, politicians, beauty queens, now on the front lines defending their country under siege. When Russia declared war on us, on Ukraine, and this is when I decided to arm myself, and uh, this is when I got my Kalashnikov, and for the last five days I spent trying to learn to use it. Ukrainian parliament member Kira Rudik going viral for her post bearing arms, preparing for the raids in Kyiv. We have given away like 20,000 uh, Kalashnikovs and uh, mine is one of them. Men are required by martial law to stay back and fight the Russian invasion. But many women are foregoing the chance to leave. I was helping my husband to pack for a war, you know, like T-shirts, underwear, weapons. Um, and then I thought, okay, he's going to war. I'm going to. So we are here together. And there is Anastasia Lena, a former Miss Grand Ukraine. Photos of her on Instagram in fatigues, rifle in hand. Underneath, patriotic hashtags. One video in her story with the caption, training, the invaders will die on our land. All world, see this. Alina Misker remaining in the outskirts of the capital, Kyiv, needing provisions for citizens and soldiers alike. Talking with us from her darkened home, lights off for safety. We decided to bake bread for our soldiers, so we bake it for free in case we are needed, we shall help. Women of Ukraine hoping that like them, the world will take notice and take action. We will now have a generation of children who know what war is, who will know to go down to the bomb shelter after when the siren is alarmed. This is what makes me very angry, and this is what empowers me. Our thanks to Ariel for that, and still to come, both young and old, standing in solidarity with Ukraine. This is what being live is Three, all about. Five, this is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people this squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. 
This is the story of Elizabeth Holmes. You got intrigued to see fantasy. It, it's all there. Can't peel your eyes away. Any comments, Elizabeth? Any comments, Elizabeth? God bless you, girl, boss. The new man in her life, the new baby. And now, as Elizabeth Holmes awaits sentencing, what you haven't seen, haven't heard. Behind the scenes, it was an absolute mess. My jaw dropped. Part of the human trait, being fascinated by a train wreck. I was blown away. The new 2020 Friday night on ABC. Okay, now, I love me some GMA so much. Time for me to do, well, a little GMA-ish promo. Ready? GMA 7A every day. Boom, boom, boom. Bring your friends. Yes, now we're talking. That's how you start the day with Robin, George, Michael, and GMA. Starting sharp at 7A every day. So go on. Just say, good morning, America. Good morning, America. You know it's America's number one morning show, people. Bring your friends. Let's talk about OnlyFans. The Instagram, but for porn. OnlyFans is massively a part of the pop culture zeitgeist right now. OnlyFans has definitely enabled us to call the shots. Anyone can come in from the ground floor and start making money. A lot of celebrities joining OnlyFans. Cardi B, Chris Brown. Bella Thorne. Within 24 hours, she made $1 million. You either love me or you hate me. I think of it as like an online playground. OnlyFans selling sexy exclusively on Hulu. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is the story of Elizabeth Holmes. You got intrigued to see fantasy. You can't peel your eyes away. Now, as Elizabeth Holmes awaits sentencing, what you haven't heard. I was blown away. The new 2020 Friday night on ABC. Finally tonight, we saw the scenes all weekend, and really since this conflict began here in the U.S., both young and old standing in solidarity with prayers and protests for peace in Ukraine. From protests to prayer, across the country, Ukrainian Americans are coming together seeking peace. Familiar hymns soothing these parishioners at the Guardian Angel Roman Catholic Church in Brooklyn, concerned about their families in Ukraine. It's heartbreaking, especially when like fathers leave home and leave their children and they know that they're gonna stay because they need to fight. This woman, originally from Ukraine, lights a candle during a prayer service in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. I want to say to our European allies. Others united this weekend to rally in support of their home country from Portland, Oregon. These are people that love their country and will do anything for freedom. Harvard stands with Ukraine. To Cambridge, Massachusetts, where more than 500 students gathered at a rally in Harvard Yard. Some proudly waving the blue and yellow flag of Ukraine. Many of my classmates as well as friends will go and fight this war and perhaps they might die. And in Los Angeles. I have family in Ukraine. For the last two days, they've been careful. They've been hiding. The lights have been out. They're packed to go, but they're staying their ground. Solidarity in the streets a world away. Ukraine, stay strong. Stop the war offering whatever support they can. And that's our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. We thank you so much for streaming with us. Have a good night.
local stories of our time, anytime.